uh, the old facility. Um, now we have our own conference center. We've run um, several summits out of here and, and we just love this facility. It comes with a lot of uh, cool things, including the fact that we're gonna be filming this entire thing and putting it up online uh, for everyone that, that couldn't make it. I uh, wanna welcome everyone to uh, Colorado and to USA Cycling. And um, for those of, uh, watching this that might not know me, I'm Sean Farrell, the Tech Tool Director. I'm gonna avoid giving a lot of sessions myself because most of you are all sick of hearing me anyway. But uh, we have a, a, quite a lineup for you uh, today and tomorrow. There's gonna be some changes uh, for those of you looking at your agenda. Um, we're already getting some uh, big snows up on the, the pass between here and Denver, and our CEO, Steve Johnson, is unable to make it right now. So we're going to uh, reshuffle uh, some of our, uh, our order of events here anyway. And uh, this morning we'll, be, uh, we'll just be advancing for a couple of the sessions anyway until we come up with an overall plan of how we're going to reorganize. But uh, it was really cool to see a lot of you again. Um, Show of hands, how many of you who were not here two years ago? So quite a few newbies, that is awesome. So uh, thank you all for uh, giving us your weekend and uh, spending a lot of your own money to get here and, and, and your own time. And um, that's uh, very much appreciated by, uh, by all of us. And uh, looking forward to uh, not just presenting stuff, but I'm hoping this will be a very interactive uh, sort of uh, weekend. Um, after some of the comments from last year, one of the things we did is we did not pack as many sessions in. Uh, we're, we're not running as tight a schedule. Uh, we're trying to leave time for people to uh, talk freely amongst themselves, break into small groups. We built in some discussion time that way and, and left some extra break times and slightly longer breaks than we, we have in the past. Um, because one of the, the feedback we got from our first summit was that uh, one of the most valuable parts of it was getting all you guys here in, in one room and getting to see other people from other regions or get to spend time with people in your region. So hopefully uh, you'll, you'll like what we've put together. Um, right now we're going to, uh, um, actually one more thing before I, before I continue, I would like to thank uh, a few people. Um, my uh, right-hand man, Tom Mahoney, our, our master of the control panel here. Uh, <laughs> He has uh, been the backbone of uh, a lot of things going on the last uh, few weeks, um, and I couldn't have done this without him. Uh, in fact, there's probably stuff happening here that I don't even know about that's going to work flawlessly because he realized I hadn't thought of it, and he's doing it anyway. And uh, we have Kerry Shipley as our uh, IT person that has dedicated his entire weekend to making sure that this room works perfectly for us. And uh, He's going to be around helping us out uh, the entire time. And the whole events department. And this basically is an events department function. And um, you met two of them last night, if you were here, our, our two excellent bartenders, Tara and Sam. And uh, you'll meet. And tonight, uh, if you come to the dinner, you'll meet two more excellent bartenders, which will be Rachel and Tony. But uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to our first presenter of the morning, um, National Commissar Steve Stone, who is going to present a seminar on leadership. And with that, I will turn it over to him. Come on up, Steve. Okay. All right. out of the podium. Okay. Yeah. Actually, how about, can we just pull it out here? Uh, there should be an off switch. There's an off switch. Nothing like being the first presenter and working the technology. Yeah. Um, okay, so the first thing we have to do is a little administrivia. Um, 
you have an opportunity to task our vice president here to do some menial labor for you. So if you need a power strip to plug your computer in, will you raise your hand so that Micah can go get a power strip uh, and get you set up with power? Anybody? You're off the hook, Micah. So, okay, so the second little bit of administration we have to take care of is uh, I regret that I'm struggling through a cold right now. And uh, so if I start hawking up a lung or getting all choked up today, it's probably the cold that I'm fighting with. However, I do admit it's possible that it could be my shock and awe at what I saw this morning uh, in the gym at the hotel. There were more USA Cycling officials working out in the gym this morning than I have ever seen in my life. It was amazing, but you could tell where they came from by when they arrived in the gym, okay? <laughs> the East Coast officials, Paula Henry over here, who's a notorious early riser on the East Coast, was there first, and then there were the East Coast folks, and then there were the East Coast folks who had a little bit more to drink last night. They showed up, and then the Midwesterners, and as I was leaving, then it was all the West Coast folks. So. Uh, if, uh, if I get choked up, it might be just that amazing uh, thing that I saw this morning. All right, so let's get started. So what I would like to do with you all this morning is spend some time talking about small unit leadership in combat. All right, and what I want to do is to discuss the leadership characteristics necessary to take some of the finest young Americans and turn them into a tightly coupled team of steely-eyed fighters, Bonnie, Excuse me, at ease. I'm talking here. You get, there's a problem? Bike racing. I mean, this isn't Fort Carson. You guys aren't the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment. Uh-oh, I got the wrong slides again. Sorry. Let, let, me, let me see if I can fix this here. All right. All right, this is the right one. So what I want to talk about today is officiating crew leadership in competition. And I really do want to talk about some of the leadership characteristics and things that you can do as a leader to help form a crew of some of the finest officials in the country. Those of you that came to this room, you've identified yourself just by being here. Uh, but how can we turn that into a high-performing crew to officiate a bike race? Okay, now I have to take a pause. This is the point in the, in the presentation where those of you who don't know me are going, who the heck is this nutcase up here on the stage and why is he talking to me? And those of you that do know me are scratching your head going, oh my God, what's Stone up to again this time? All right, it's so a little bit of background. Uh, about six years ago, I retired after a 24-year career in the United States Army. Uh, something that explains a lot is the first about 12 years of that, I was in armored cavalry regiments. And cavalrymen are just crazy, okay? So some of my charming personality comes from that experience. Uh, but during that time, I also had the privilege of leading some of America's finest young soldiers in combat. And all told, it was about 16 months in combat time, uh, split between the Middle East in Iraq uh, and also in the Balkans in Kosovo and Bosnia. So if you want to learn about leadership, try leading some young people in an endeavor where if they do what you ask them, they may lose their life. It's a real opportunity to understand what makes people tick and what they need to be uh, what you need and what they need from you as a leader. The other part that I'll mention is during that time, I've also been a bike racing official. This will be my 19th year uh, as, a, as a USA cycling official. And one of the things that's been really interesting for me is how similar bike racing is to combat. And this is the point in the audience where you all stand up and say, Steve, how similar is bike racing to combat? All right, anybody? Thank you, Todd. I'm glad you asked because I have a chart. Let's talk about <laughs> some of the similar characteristics between leading some young troops in combat and leading a crew uh, at a bike race. So first thing, and this is true in any leadership endeavor, the real goal is to build a team, a well-performing team of people that come from different backgrounds, they have different skills, they have different personalities, and different motivations. And that's true in combat, and that's true in a bike race. One of the things that's also been obvious to me is you have long periods of tedium followed by intense period of chaos where everything just breaks loose and you have to deal with it. And that is, in fact, true both in bike racing and combat. We all know this. You can't stop when the weather gets bad. 
I have been colder and wetter and more miserable at bike races than I ever was in a combat situation. All right. And if you get to work with Phil officiating a race in the middle of a tropical storm, it just doesn't get any better than that. All right. So the other thing that's true about a, both a bike race and combat uh, is that you've got to synchronize and, and coordinate the movement of lots of people and lots of vehicles. And if you ever work one of Chuck's races, okay, there is more radio communications going on and vehicles moving and just stuff happening around you as if you're moving a cavalry regiment across the desert trying to find the Iraqi Republican Guard. It's the same thing. All right. The other thing that's true in both cases is getting surprised <laughs> is really, really bad. Okay? I'll tell you, as, as an official and also as a, as a military officer, you make mistakes when you get surprised. That's when we screw up as officials, when something catches us that we didn't think about. And unfortunately, in combat, if something catches you when you don't think about it, you didn't think about it, that's when people get hurt. So the other part that's really true is there's always somebody or something out there that's trying to surprise you. Okay? And because of that, whatever plan you had doesn't survive first contact either with the enemy or with bike racers. Something is going to happen that causes you to change your plan. And in both cases, sometimes somebody actually takes a shot at you and you're in the line of fire. Now in combat, we know that happens. At a bike race, hope it doesn't literally happen, but you all know you've been there. As an official, you're in the line of fire. Does that make sense? Sometimes you just got to go when you got to go, right? I won't tell you how we did that in the tanks, okay? But so as, as all of these things, as I've worked both, uh, both careers, has struck me, what I'd like to do is share with you some of the things that I learned first as a military officer uh, and tested and trained in combat and now have applied to, uh, to bike racing. First thing I want to talk about really is what's management versus leadership. Any thoughts on that? Everybody's silent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? You guys know, those of you who've been in business, you know, this has been a big discussion for years about, you know, what's, of, uh, what's management and what's leadership. And I'll tell you, this is, this is necessary. This is not a criticism of, of the USA Cycling uh, Officials Education Program, but almost all of the instruction that we get and the training that we get is about how to manage a bike race. You know, what's the schedule? What's the logistics? Who, what assignments do we need? You know, who's going to do what when? When do we get food? When do we have time to go to the bathroom? You know, all those sorts of things. And, and that's all necessary. But good management in and of itself does not equate to good leadership. Okay, a lot of the things that we get trained in, in the courses is about how to manage the things at the race, but not about how to lead the people. So in, in our profession, good management is absolutely necessary uh, to be a good leader of a, of a bike race crew, uh, but it's not sufficient. And I will tell you, it's also hard, I think, not, not impossible, but it's hard to be a good officiating leader if you're not a good manager. I think it can be done. It's perfectly okay to delegate things on a crew, and, uh, and you should. But uh, if you haven't, don't have the management skills to think about all those things that go on over the course of a week-long event, you're probably going to have, have struggle as a leader. This is my opinion, and, and there's, a, there's a blur here. Management and leadership are, are intertwined. In my opinion, management is mainly a pre-event preparation. Uh, sort of activity. And then your leadership skills actually build upon that preparation to make sure that your team of people can take the information from that you've done through your management skills and your plan for the event and actually conduct a good bike race. That all make sense? So the other thing I'm going to tell you is I can stand up here for the hour and I can give you all my opinion and absolutely none of it may be relevant to you. I hope it is. I believe it is. 
But a lot of leadership is personal. Being a good leader is the most personal endeavor you will ever undertake. And I'm going to explain why. Right. First thing is you can't fake it. Right. You have to be and instill in yourself leadership characteristics uh, that work for you to be a good leader. You can't copy it. You can't say, well, I'm just going to do everything that Steve said, and I'll be a great leader. Because what works for me, I guarantee you probably won't work for you. All right? You can't emulate things, and we all do that. We all look at other officials that we work with and other people that we see in leadership roles, and we say, yeah, I really like that. I want to incorporate that in mine. But you can't just copy it. All right? You've got to be genuine. Right? Being an effective leader is all about figuring out what works for you and putting yourself out there and being open and honest and genuine with your folks. All right? Doesn't mean you have to tell everybody everything, but it really is putting yourself out front and saying, here I am, Here's, I'm gonna, the leader, I'm going to try to mold this crew into do, uh, do a good job at this event, and, and here's, uh, here's what I got. So you got to learn what works for you. And this is, this is an ongoing thing. This is the thing that I find personally fascinating about being uh, a leader, is that it's always changing. It's always situationally dependent. So what's the right thing for me to do at this point in this situation with these people uh, in these circumstances? Okay. The other thing you have to do is you have to learn what works for the other people. All right? I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a slide or two here. So for me, leadership is all about molding that crew, all right, to how do you get this group of people who you may have just met today or you've known a little bit and haven't really worked with much, how do you pull them together in a way that you can build this high-performing crew to pull off this complex thing that we call a bike race? So you got a group of individuals. They all come with varying backgrounds. They have varying expectations for that particular event. Okay. We do have some common training that we can build upon. Um, but you know, what's interesting as you move around the country, some of that common training is done differently in different parts of the country. There's always a little bit of variation there. We have varying skills and varying motivations um, out there. We all have a different reason for ourselves to go be a bike racing official. Okay. And sometimes those change. I mean, they may change from event to event, but it's always something to keep in mind. But really, the goal, again, is how do you turn that group of people into that high-performing team that can pull off this complicated endeavor we call a bike race? So one of the things I find, again, we mentioned this, find fascinating. I like thinking about myself and, and my leadership skills. Um, one of the things is I transitioned out of the military and into a civilian organization was learning about new types of people and how they like to be led. Uh, one of the things in the military, you know, everybody goes through basic training, doesn't matter what service you're in or whatever, you kind of have, have a common foundation you can work off of. And you start to get the lingo and all that. And that's true for us, too, particularly all of us that have been here. I mean, we've been doing this for a while before you, you come to this level. Um, but figuring out what types of folks are out there and what do they need uh, and, and what kind of leadership styles do they like uh, is, is essential. So I'm going to put some gross generalizations up here. The names have been removed to protect anybody who's in the room that I modeled this off of, okay? But some, some general examples of the kinds of officials, the types of officials that you might find out there on your crew. Now, this particular subject, too, I'll tell you, we could spend a week in here just talking about people and the, their preferences for leadership styles. I mean, if you're a Myers-Briggs person or if you're this model or that model, I mean, you could do a doctoral dissertation and all this sort of stuff. We don't have the kind of time. So I'm going to give you some generalizations. Um, and the first one... The one you hope your entire crew is made up of is that that official who comes in and says, just give me the expectations for the event. I, I'm well trained. I know what I need to do. Tell me your expectations. Let me go do the job. And they go off and do an excellent job. And they don't require any particular intervention, any instruction, any guidance. They just go do it. And ideally, that's what you want on every crew. Anybody ever, ever had a crew that was completely made up of those type of people? Every once in a while. Every once in a while. But it's normally not the case. So then you have the person sometimes that really knows the job, 
They're highly skilled. They're motivated. They just want some validation that they're doing the right thing. And, and this is often the case that maybe that new fast-tracking official that's moving up to the next level. They really do know what they're doing, but they're just not sure that they're doing it exactly right. So they just want a little validation from you as the leader that, yeah, I'm doing this the right way. Excuse me. So those people are great. They don't take a whole lot of time, but you do have to pay attention uh, and make sure that they're getting what they need. All right. There's another type of official out there that's the one that, again, highly skilled, knows what they're doing, but just a little uncertain. Wants that detailed instruction on what, you, what they need to do when. This takes a little bit more time from the leader. A little bit more uh, attention to that person. But again, they, they know what they're doing. They just need you to confirm that what they have in their mind is what you want done. Not a bad problem, but uh, again, takes a little bit more time to work with. Then there's the person. We all know these. Again, very knowledgeable person. Knows the rule book, and boy, do they want you to know how well they know the rule book and how well they know the job. Uh, sometimes these kinds of folks can be a little trying as the leader, okay? And uh, they may require a little more patience, a little more attention, uh, a little bit more uh, finger spitzing gefühl as you apply your touch to that individual, okay? But they're also out there. Now, what's common about all these four types of officials? Right. They're all competent, they all want to do a good job, and they want to know that you, as the leader, care about their performance in the job. Every one of those, those four types of officials right there, all they want is what, from you is their, meet their needs to validate or ensure that they're doing what you need done. And they're all motivated, and they're all skilled, and you know, we won't talk about the ones that show up that aren't motivated and aren't skilled, because we generally don't see that very much, but it does happen. But they all want to know that you care about their performance. That makes sense? So, for me, I tried to distill my, some of my thoughts on leadership down to one slide here. Um, and really, what is leadership about? And for me, my interpretation is leadership's about providing all those things, and I call them resources on this slide, and I'm not sure that's the right word, but it's the best one I can come up with right now. This is all about providing the resources for success. So what do I mean by that? This is a question that I ask myself every time I go into, or hopefully almost every time I go into a, a leadership position. And I'll talk about what I mean by resources, but the question is, is what resources can I provide for this official, that individual, to succeed in helping this crew be successful in this event? Okay. And if you can go down your list of, of folks on the crew and you can answer that question, you're probably in pretty good shape as the leader of that crew. All right? So now the question is, how do you learn, how do you know what the individuals on your crew need? Well, we all work together. You know, a lot of good friends in here we've been working with for years. Um, there's some folks in here who I've never met. All right? So some of you, I have a pretty good idea. You're, the things you like, the things you dislike, um, you know, what your particular hot buttons are, all those sorts of things. So those are pretty easy. But even then, for a particular event, uh, you know, you could be having a bad day, you could have something going on, you could have a particular goal or objective that you need, you want to meet for that event. So even somebody who I've known for 20 years, I may need to be able to ask that, you know, think about that question, and what does this person need for this event? So I'll tell you, one of the things we don't do well as a, as a society, and, and key to being a leader is all about listening. Now, I don't mean stand there and talking to them, all right? I mean actually taking a few minutes and having a conversation where you actually listen to the individual on your crew. And, and this is sometimes hard to do. You've got a compressed amount of time when you're, you're putting, you know, getting the crew together and getting started. But you know, we all ought to take a few minutes to go talk one-on-one, -on -one, just you and that person. It doesn't have to be in private, but focus on that individual for a few minutes so that they can tell you Maybe directly, maybe indirectly, but if you listen and you pay attention to what the individual says and their body language and everything else, they'll start to give you an idea of what they need from you as the leader to be successful for that event. And this is a skill that you have to keep working on your entire life. 
it's real, real easy uh, as the crew chief or the leader to get distracted by the crisis, whatever's going on at the moment. But if you can take just a few minutes to actually sit down and listen to the member of the crew, they'll tell you what they need. They probably won't tell you directly. Well, I need your validation to tell me that I'm doing the right thing, and I need you to tell me this at this point in the race, and this point in the race, and this point in the race. You're not going to get that, but you can get an idea. Does that make sense? Okay. It's real easy to say. It's hard to do sometimes. Any questions so far? Well, let's talk about a partial list of the resources that a leader can provide to a group of people. And I'll tell you, the first one and absolute most important one is caring or compassion. You pick the word that you want to use. But it is very, very difficult to be a good leader if you don't care about the performance of that individual. Now, does that mean that you have to like that individual? Absolutely not. Anybody want to raise their hand and say they absolutely like everybody in the room, that's their best buddy ever, and you love to spend quality time with them? No, that's not what we're saying here. But the leader has to demonstrate an interest in that person's performance and their success for whatever that endeavor is. Okay? Call that caring compassion, depending whether you're a fluffy you know, person or not. Another one is courage. You may tell me why the leader needs to be courageous. Anybody? Kevin. Right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Tom? Another element is outside of having to make the hard decisions or not necessarily being like Barry or everyone. Demonstration of courage shows to the rest of your team that it's okay to do the thing that might look dangerous. Mm -hmm. Right? Diane? Right? Absolutely. All of those are correct. And you know, we all get taught about making the hard decisions and having the courage to stand up for the right call at the right time and all that. And, that, and that's all essential. But I think there's, there's another little piece there that nobody touched on. Absolutely. And, and it really is, I'm going I'm to take that and run with it a little bit more. It's the courage to expose yourself to those that you are leading. Okay, and unfortunately, you know, sometimes when you put yourself out there, you might show your ass a little bit, okay? Excuse my, uh, my army, but 24 years in the army, we do use some of that colorful language at times. But you actually get, you got to have the courage to put yourself in the line of the fire and actually make yourself a little bit vulnerable. Because if you're the leader, you're going to expose your weaknesses. You're going to expose some of the things that you don't do well. You might expose some biases that you may have, okay? And, and you got to be willing to put those out there in front of your crew or, your, or the group you're leading and say, here I am, I'm 100% I'm invested in this, and here's, here's me. Okay? And that takes some courage sometimes. It takes some guts because you open yourself up to criticism of you as a person, not just your performance, but in some ways criticism of the person. So you've got to have some courage there that you're willing to do that in order to be a highly effective leader. Okay? Does that make sense? What about candor? All right. You can call it honesty. You can call it truthfulness. But I like the word candor. And I don't know why a lot of these leadership words start with the letter C, but there seem to, seems to be the case. Um, why candor? Builds trust. Builds trust. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Shows responsibility to the, uh, to the job? Absolutely. You've got to be willing to speak truthfully and honestly about what's going on. Now, you also have to do that with a little bit of caring and compassion, okay? It's always a bad thing for the leader to go and, you know, just belittle somebody and, and just, you're the worst official I've ever seen, I can't believe you did that, and so on and so forth. But you've got to be willing to put that out there and say, hey, you know, your performance or today wasn't quite what we wanted or we screwed this up as a team or I screwed this up as a leader, let's fix it or whatever, and, uh, and move forward. But, you know, one of the things that I think is really important as a leader 
uh, is if you can mix the compassion and the candor, and you can give honest feedback, and, and in fact, tell the person, and this has happened, tell the official in our case that, you know, you really didn't have a good, your performance wasn't that good today, and have them walk away knowing exactly what they did, how they can fix it, and knowing that you care about them, you can actually chew somebody out, so to speak, and have them walk away feeling good about it. And I have a boss, uh, a colleague now who was my boss that was, was excellent at that. You know, you guys know me. I screw up an awful lot. And this happened to be in the work environment. And I used to get chewed about once a week by this particular uh, young lady. And I always walked away saying, yep, okay, I know I made a mistake. I know what the expectations are. And yeah, thank you. I appreciate you telling me this. And, and we don't do that enough as officials. So candor is really, really important in this. We talked a little bit about trust. Um, I think it's really hard to be a leader if you don't demonstrate trust to those you're leading. Um, my philosophy is everybody comes in with 100%, my 100% of my trust in their ability to do the job until they prove me otherwise. Okay, and sometimes that happens. And then that's where the candor comes in. But you got to trust your, your folks. You got to respect your folks. If you start to demonstrate, you know, some of those biases I talked about, we all have them. All right, you have to be aware of those, but if you start to demonstrate a little bit of lack of trust or a little bit of lack, don't have the respect for those you're leading, it really starts to undermine your credibility as a leader. Obviously, it's really hard to be a good leader if you're not competent at your job. Um, both competence at the mechanics, the, the skills that we have to demonstrate as officials is absolutely essential, but you also need to demonstrate some of that competence of, as a leader, and I hope some of what we're talking about today will, uh, will help you there. You have to demonstrate confidence. How many of you have ever been in a situation where the race is going to heck, the crew's falling apart, and you have to stand there and go, not a problem. We got it. We can fix this. Right? It's, it's part of that. There are times you have to demonstrate confidence when you know, right down here in your gut, you may not be feeling that. Okay? We'll talk a little bit about performance in a minute. Um, confidence is always really important. Always have to demonstrate your confidence in the crew and the ability to solve the problem, deal with whatever's happening, even if deep inside you're going, oh my God, I can't believe we just did that. It happens. We talk about empathy in context of dealing with angry riders. But what about empathy in dealing with your crew? We all have bad days. We all make mistakes. We all get irritated by other crew members, by promoters, by riders, and whatever. A little empathy from the, the leader of the crew goes a long way into settling that down. So, yep, all those techniques, you, you know, you, we talk about dealing with the angry rider. Well, you can deal with the angry official just as well. So you're telling me that the promoter did this and you're upset. You know, all those sorts of techniques uh, are really, really useful in this context as well. All right. Any questions so far? Good head nods. Everybody seems to be awake. So we're not doing too good. Communication. Um, another area where we all need to continually focus on. Um, I, I learned, I had an opportunity to go up and, and evaluate a race last fall in New England. And uh, Kenan and Paul and I were talking about this this morning. And I learned that I'm from away. And, and in Virginia, we don't speak the same language as they speak in New England. Uh, so I learned some things. It, absolutely. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me rephrase that. Copy that. Okay, so we, we had some we had some discussions during that race about communication. So being open, uh, keeping the lines of communication open, uh, being open to have people come to you is all important, and and also knowing that we work with a diverse group of people from around the country, sometimes around the world, understanding that people use different words, uh, they they understand body language and other things a little bit differently is all important. Uh, and trying to keep it as, as clear as possible is, is always nice. Attentiveness. What do I mean by attentiveness? Why does the leader need to be attentive? Present, right? Let me give you an example. It's the national championships. It's the notorious 18-hour criterium day, right? Why Mike and Tom allowed that in there, I don't know, but, you know. Um, <laughs> It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you're in Augusta, it's 99 degrees, and you, as the leader of the crew, happen to be on your break, because you, you did your management correctly and you scheduled in breaks, so you know, people got a chance to go sit down. 
But all of a sudden, the radio batteries start to die. People are really hot and tired and frustrated. And you start to hear the anxiety and the angst raise on the radio. And people are saying, wait, what, what did you say? Wait, you're not giving me the information I need, and all these sorts of things. And, you know, you're sitting in the tent, in the VIP tent, having a cold drink. All right? Can you shut down as the, as the leader? Absolutely not. You've got to be, be aware of what's going on, not just with the event, but with your crew, with the individuals on your crew. Who's struggling at that point right there? And who needs to go sit down for a while? Who needs a drink? Who needs just a little word of encouragement? In this case, I could tell you it was, hey, everybody, sounds like we're having some trouble. Everybody take a drink of water. Everybody put a new battery in. Um, and everybody focus on your communication for the next 30 minutes of this crit and make sure that the other people can understand what's going on. And, you know, the anxiety level calms down. Everybody chills out a little bit, and the crew keeps going on and did a great job that day. So when you're the leader, you can't shut down. And that may be at night in your hotel room, too. All right? So one of the things about being the leader is you're always on duty, even if you're off at that point. Right, so that's what I mean by attentiveness. What about the example? Anybody tell me what I mean by the 70% rule? All right, so this is where I got to tell a little bit of a war story. Young 2nd Lieutenant Steve Stone in 1st Squadron, 1st Cavalry, has his office call with Command Sergeant Major Mike Bauman. Anybody who's been in the military knows that Command Sergeant Majors actually outrank the commanding officer. They're God. You can't do anything to them. They've been in the Army forever. Right? Sergeant Major Bauman sat me down and said, Lieutenant, your best troop, the most squared away, high-performing soldier you have, is only going to achieve 70% of the example that you set. And that happened in 1986 was when he told me that, and it still sticks with me. Now, for us in, in this business, we all tend to be a little more senior than the 18-year-old private a little bit more experienced, and we're here voluntarily. So I don't know if that 70% figure is correct for this group. But I believe it is true that your best performing officials on your crew are going to achieve only some percentage of the, the example that you set. So setting the example, uh, and both in appearance, conduct, expectations, skills, all those sorts of things, is really, really important. And if you set a poor example, you're doomed. Part of that is establishing clear performance expectations for your crew. And what do I mean by that? Excuse me for a second. We all know that when you make the assignments and you tell somebody you're going to be the assistant judge, there's some expectations that come with that. Okay? But those expectations are as far as what, what that official is going to do. What are the expectations you've set for how well you want the official to do that. So this is something else I think that we as a, as a collective body can do better at. It's always a little bit challenging, but how well do we want to perform our job? Well, hey, Chief Judge, my, what I'd really like to have happen is I would like 100% accurate results posted by the time the riders get off their bikes after they cool down. Okay? All right. Is that a reasonable expectation or not? Well, that depends on the circumstances you're working in. Right? Or, or motor refs, you know? I would like, make sure, I want, really want to focus on make sure we cover every service is covered by a motor uh, during this. And, you know, you're not always going to get 100% achievement of these expectations. But have you set those kinds of performance expectations for members of your crew? And they can be real simple. I'd like everybody to be on time this morning. You know, that's a good one. Uh, but, but there's those sorts of things that you as the leader of the crew can, can do. And it just takes a minute. Um, a few minutes of discussion in your crew meeting before the event. So the other thing that, that you as the leader owe your crew is to be prepared. Okay? Now we talked about the management and the pre-event preparation and you know, schedule and assignments and all those sorts of things. But you owe it to your crew to be prepared to fill that leadership role. Now what do I mean? Hey, I've thought about who's on my crew. I've sort of gone through a mental list of, I know this person, I know what they like, don't like. I don't know this person, so I need to focus on them uh, when, when I meet them. Those sorts of things. So if you've done that preparation, these are some of the things that we might run into that I, as the leader, may have to step into. We've got a really, really long day, and we need to make sure we take care of everybody and that everybody understands 
you know, how we're going to run that, and I'm aware and I can step in when we have a problem. Those sorts of things, okay? Really, really important to do as well. So the other part is performance. And this is not in doing your job. This is actually the acting part of being a leader. And I said earlier, you know, you can't copy it. You can't fake it. That's all true. But you can portray the role a little bit. And again, it's that bad day when everything's all going to hell, right? And you're, everything's falling apart, and you stand there and say, it's not a problem. We can handle this, okay? And so like in combat, it's the company commander standing up as the rifle fire goes off around him and says, Ah, not a problem. You go do this. You go do that. You know, and we'll take this, this sniper out or whatever. Uh, so there is a little bit of acting here. And uh, you can't overuse it. But there are times when you've got to stand up and, and put on a little bit of a show just to keep the crew going. All right? Does that make sense? Anybody disagree with anything up there? Any comments on this before I move on to another topic? Okay. This is clearly not a comprehensive list. There's lots of other things that you could put on this list, and you've got to figure out what those are for you. Okay? So one of the things I want to talk about, too, in leadership is the concept of formal versus informal leadership. Anybody tell me what that means? Judy, you got any ideas? You keep smiling at me so you caught my attention. No. Okay. Anybody? Yes, sir. Right. Ah. Right. Absolutely. And for those of us in the room that are, you know, at the level where we decide to pay the money to come here to Colorado for the weekend, that's absolutely the case. So yeah, the formal leaders, clearly the chief judge, chief referee, lead motor, you know, whatever else you've got on that particular crew. But the informal leaders. Of course, everybody else on the crew is an informal leader. What about mentors? I've, we've now gotten to the point uh, in my local association where there are times there are mentors or trainers at the event as well, just to help that new chief referee or chief judge or whatever work. They're absolutely informal leaders there. And I do have to put in a plug. We're not talking about mentoring today. But tomorrow, if you come to the mentoring session with Dot and Bonnie and I, we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about specifically about mentoring. Um, I mean, you've had the off-duty official, somebody who just likes hanging out at bike races and wants to come hang out at your race, right? Are they part of the informal leadership? Absolutely. As you mentioned, informal leaders can be a very positive influence. It can also be a negative influence, okay? So I want to ask everybody, all of us here, because we are often sometimes the informal leader on a crew because you're working with a new chief ref or you're just there, they're doing an evaluation, whatever. Let's focus on how to be better informal leaders. So what do I mean by that? First thing, and we, we all know this, but sometimes we slip a little bit. You've got to follow the formal leader, at least in public. Okay? And, you know, we talk about, you know, decisions on our crew are unanimous and those sorts of things. But if you're there in an informal leadership role, that's particularly important. Make sure that you support the formal leader uh, as best as possible. One of the things I also enjoy, and I, I enjoy working with a lot of you at different times too, is there are lots of different ways to do things, and they're all correct. They may not be the way that you choose to do it, but again, particularly as a, as a leader, it may be the right way for that person to be the leader of that crew. So I enjoy watching other people work and understand and, and figure out what they're doing, why they're doing it, and those sorts of things. So it's always important to, to remember that just because somebody's not doing it the way you would doesn't mean they're wrong, and you can support the way that they're doing it. Okay? The other part, always a challenge, and we all have to be careful, particularly those of us as senior leaders, is what we say, even at the event, after the event, online, all those sorts of things, is make sure that we provide that advice uh, and that constructive um, Criticism, it will, in a positive way. And, and many of us do that here. I mean, it's generally not a problem. I just wanted to bring it back up to reemphasize. You know, as you see things, particularly as you're in an informal leadership role, um, make sure you do that in a way that supports the, the development of that official, the effective functioning of the crew, um, and you do that in a way with, with compassion and with the candor that's necessary to do that. Okay. So I have to admit, I'm stealing this from Andy. 
This was in a slide that Andy gave, I saw in a, present, a presentation a few years ago from, from him, and I really like this. So leadership, particularly as a senior official, is all about adding to your presence as an official. And I'm just going to flip through this, okay? I think a lot of us have seen this before, okay? But as you think about your leadership skills, think about how they add to your presence and to the way that your crews function. One of the things that was clear to me after my time in the military is every unit I was ever in took on the personality or the presence of their commanding officer. Okay? Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. All right, so you as the leader have an amazing influence on the way that that crew functions and kind of the personality, the presence of your crew. So you got to think about that and be aware of that. And you know, if you're a high-strung person, high energy, always going, you know, that's probably the personality that your crew is going to take on, particularly in a longer event. I mean, that affects a little bit less in a one-day sort of event, but if you've got a crew for a week, or I'm assuming, Randy, that probably absolutely happens in the three-week events, and you really start to take on that personality. So you've got to think about that, okay, and understand uh, what effect your presence is having on the crew, and you want to do that in a way that's positive, and it works for you, and it works for your people. And that's the art of being a leader. Okay. All right. So there's always a test. Every class has a test. So, and again, because you're here and have demonstrated that you are a senior leader in the USA Cycling Officials, you have homework assignment from this. All right? And your homework assignment for this season is to work on your leadership philosophy. And I believe, I mean, I, I like to write things down. Everybody has their own style. But your assignment for this season is to think about your leadership philosophy and document it in the way that works for you. Okay? And I'm going to share with you mine. This is, works, this is what works for me. You can borrow it all you want, but I want you to figure out what yours is and what works for you. So this is, uh, this is mine. As a leader, I motivate others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more. That's my goal as a leader, be that in the corporate world, be that in my family, be that as an official. Okay, I see lots of people taking notes, but I think these slides will be up. Uh, Tom will get these up in a day or two, so these will all be out there. Okay? And I do this by setting the example. For me, that's the number one uh, portion about being a leader. I understand the needs and desires of those I lead. I guide them in setting their vision of the future. And that may be, the future may just be the one day event that you're working. It could be the week long event, it could be the season, it could be their officiating career. But you can help them do that. I set challenging yet hopefully achievable expectations. My example of 100% accurate results in 10 minutes, is that challenging? Yes. Is it achievable? Sometimes. You, know, you don't want to make them so far out there that people go, ah, there's just no way but you got to set those that uh, are challenging and achievable. It's amazing how people get motivated when you do that. I provide the resources necessary to achieve that vision. And then I observe and I coach as they go along. So this season, your task is to figure out what your leadership philosophy is and to apply it to your, your job and your performance as, uh, as a leader in USA Cycling. And as you do that, I know you can't copy people, but I want to consider who you might want to emulate. Oops, let me hit the right slide. So who do you want to be as your leader? You can be George Washington, a pretty good leader. I come from Virginia. We see a lot of him around there. Maybe Margaret Thatcher, you know, another, uh, another fine leader. Or do you want to be this guy? <laughs> What are your questions? <laughs> questions, comments? I've baffled everybody. Okay. Well, thank you all very much.